get this thing recording. All right. Um, so I've got a, mostly it's a presentation to give to you today, but please pipe in, you know, I, I won't, and I won't, I'll do my best at keeping my eye on it, but use the group chat if you want to ask a question or interrupt me or just speak up. Uh, that would be fine if you did that too. In many ways, I think this could be the most important, the most important lesson of the of the semester. Somebody's trying to come in. Jen, welcome. Glad to have you here. Okay. I don't know if she's having a little trouble, but anyway, we've got Jen. Good welcome. Glad to have you. So in many ways, this is the most important presentation of the year. Um, so let's get started. Um, yeah, I've got, let me just explain to you, I've got a, I've got a, a project I've been working on for many years called Divine Design. It's a um, mathematical view of God's creation is what it comes down to. And the presentation you're going to see today is one of the Divine Design uh, presentations. If you want to see more of them, all you need to do is go to divinemath.com. You know, one word, divinemath.com. Uh, I've got a website there. And you'll see that one of the presentations is the one I'm going to give you. It's called Optimal Design. Now, you've heard me use that word a bunch of times this year. We spent quite a bit of time finding optimal solutions. And what did that amount to? Pretty much using the derivative, finding it, setting it equal to zero, and solving. Finding that high point or that low point to optimize things. Okay, so that's kind of the topic here. Uh, and I'm going to be relating it to God's creation. And, uh, you know, the way God put it was God saw what he had made, and it was very good, very good. Maybe uh, he might have even said it was optimal. Another uh, place where this comes up is in Philippians 4.8. One of my favorite passages. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We need, we intend to think about some of those excellent, optimal things today. So I'm going to just show you a few mathematicians here that have thoughts on this topic. My, uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, he's the one that discovered that we're on a mathematical ride around the sun called an ellipse right now. And um, his quote was, nature uses as little as possible of anything. Uh, it's very, it's incredibly efficient. And that's even though it's groaning because of the fall. Despite that, uh, it, it it's its beauty and its optimal nature shines through. Uh, this is a French mathematician, and he said almost the same thing. He said nature always operates with the greatest possible economy. In other words, it gets things done incredibly efficiently. Uh, one of the co-discoverers of calculus. Sir Isaac Newton. He said, nature does nothing in vain, and more is in vain when less will serve. For nature is pleased with simplicity and affects not the pomp of superfluous causes. It gets the job done efficient, as efficiently as possible. We certainly talked about this guy. Remember, he's the guy that E, the number E is named after. Uh, genius, Leonard Euler, and he said, because the shape of the whole universe is most perfect and in fact designed by the wisest creator, nothing in all the world will occur in which no maximum or minimum rule is somehow shining forth. 
So the principles I'm showing you, many, I mean, they've been known for a long time, but I'm going to be showing you some of that in the context of some modern, modern day inventions, inventions. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Mr. Everything in the Middle Ages, mathematician, scientist, artist. He said human ingenuity may make various inventions, but it'll never devise any inventions more beautiful, nor more simple, nor more to the purpose than nature does, because in her inventions, nothing is wanting, nothing is superfluous. Um, there's a whole center, uh, this, this whole idea of bionics, which is uh, sometimes called biomimetics, this, the copying, copying designs in God's creation and making use of them for inventions. Um, now, there's a center devoted to that, as you can see, in Reading, England. And this is, their, this is one of their quotes. Nature works for maximum achievement at minimum effort. Boy, are those two huge words in our class this semester? They sure are. So if we look at sine wave and all it represents, I mean, it's the perfect example of going from max to min and back again. Um, and it just reminds us, that's right, those high points and those low points can be found by, of course, calculus. I'm going to skip these. Okay, now we're going to take a look at a simple math problem. The problem is we have a line and we have two points not on the line. The goal to get to find the path that goes from A, bounces off the line and goes to B, that'll give us the shortest possible path. Okay, that can be found using some simple geometry. So you can find, first draw a perpendicular from A to the line. And then um, you can find, by using copying a segment, you can find point A prime, which is the same distance away from the line on the opposite side. And then if you take that new A prime and connect it to B, okay, you will see, of course, where it crosses the line at point C. That point is the perfect point for making the path from A to B bouncing off the line into a minimum. Okay, so a fairly simple geometry problem, uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot going on here. By the way, we could have done it. We could have done it on the B side, too. We could have found point B prime, and we could have connected that back to A, and we'd have found the same point. Notice the symmetry that's present in this solution. Also, the angles formed, uh, angle, you know, the angle to the left of the, you know, you got angle, two angles formed by the red lines along with the original line, and those two angles, of course, are equal. So... We're going to show you, by the way, just a reminder, the goal was to find the, the path that was the minimum, the smallest length to get, to get to that other point by reflecting. So we're going to show, we're going to do a quick calculus problem here to prove that that is indeed what has happened. So I've got some letters in here, but basically this is the same model we have here. Uh, you got points B and A. And you got your line down there on the bottom, and I've put in some labels so we can so we can talk about this mathematically. Um, if you look closely, that little right triangle has two legs. One of them's called small b, the other one's called x, and the hypotenuse would be bp. And so you can see that b squared plus x squared equals bp squared. That's just uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Also, isn't that same thing true on the other right triangle to the right side? You've got the leg on the bottom, which happens to be C minus X, the way this is labeled. And then you've got A squared for the vertical leg. 
and the hypotenuse AP squared. Okay, well, you can solve for BP and you can solve for AP just taking the square root of both sides. Okay, now, BP plus AP is that length, that minimum length. I've been claiming that's minimum, the quickest way, the shortest way to get there. So we're going to take those two and we're going to add them together to get our total length. So T represents the entire path from B to P back up to A again. All right. So we've got a square root. Well, we could write that using fractional exponent notation, just replacing the square root signs with one half power. And then, guess what? We want to find the minimum, so we're going to take the derivative. Okay, so the derivative means, all right, I've got to do, I've got to do the power rule, and then. I have a, a chain rule, right? B squared plus X squared to the negative one half times one half times two X because I'm differentiating with respect to X. B is a constant. And then the same thing is true of the second one. One half times that whole thing to the negative one half. And then there's a chain rule. And here I have two things, two, two X terms. Negative two C is the derivative of negative two CX and 2x is the derivative of x squared. Okay. So if we just, like we did in our assignments, we convert over to the algebra form of this, it'll look like this, you know, the negative one-half power, that just means it's the square root on the bottom. And what happened to the one-half and the 2x? Well, the x is still up on top, but the one-half and the 2 canceled. Anyway, you wind up with this expression. All right. Now we could just subtract that second fraction from both sides. And that will reverse the numerator from x minus c to c minus x. And then I'm just going to make one little other change. The square root of b squared plus x squared, that's just another name for what? That's that hypotenuse, bp. And that square root of a squared plus c squared, that, that's just the square root of ap. So what we've got is this ratio, x is to bp as c minus x is to ap. Uh, in, in ratios, you can also rewrite it horizontally. Um, you know, the first numerator is to the second numerator as the first denominator is to the second denominator, just to get it in this form. And basically, if you look at it, that just tells me that triangle BCP is similar to triangle APD. And if they're similar, what do you know about similar triangles? Corresponding angles are the same. That proves that angle BPC is congruent to angle APD. Oh, yeah. So the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, a very important principle and remember, this all ref this is exactly how light works. But to get that minimum distance, those angles, BCP and APD, have to be the same. And that will give you the minimum distance. And light obeys this principle every day. You can see here a picture of light reflecting, and you can see that those two angles at the base down there, they, they're they always equal. Why? Because light always takes the minimum path to get where it needs to go. Always. So in other words, light gets calculus really well. Um, another thing, a lot of, th I mean, God's creation gets calculus. Here you see a soap film uh, wrapped around some, 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 wire frames and you can if you look closely you can see the soap film uh reflections and all i want to do is make this point when that happens the soap film automatically knows to go to a configuration that gives minimum surface area and holds the most volume calculus minimum surface area maximum volume Okay, now, the bees. 
Uh, in particular, we're going to take a look at that structure there on their honeycomb, which they themselves build, uh, is regular hexagons. Uh, uh, hexa we call that a tessellation when everything fills the space like that. And I'm going to show you a video here, and um, maybe you could just let me know in the chat window, uh, let me know if everything, if the sound is good and all. I, I'm hoping this works out funny. So here we go. Oh, before we do that, i got to just show you this. So as you can tell, there is something very famous known as the hexagonal honeycomb conjecture. And, I mean, it's been proposed for many years. And here you can see uh, Thomas Hales of the University of Michigan has proven it. He's done a proof. Um, and basically, in white, you can see what it says. Bees have discovered the most efficient way of dividing the plane into equal-sized cells. Uh, 1953, the bees knew, so but in 1953, we already knew that if they're polygons, hexagons are the best. But what Hales proved is that even if they're curved, even if you allow for curved edges, it is the best. And um, yeah, here's just a quick view of the first page of his conjecture. You can see he's getting set up to prove that Hey, that, that grid does its best job of holding the most area for the minimum perimeter. And it's, it's strongest. And it goes on and on and on. Okay. So you can kind of see that. Here I've got a large sphere, and on it are a bunch of little spheres attached. So when you look at that more close up, this is what you see. And as you scrunch them more and as you crowd more and more of them in, what are they what happens to the outer shape? Do you see how they go to regular hexagons? Yeah, it's just a natural occurrence. This is rather poor animation, but it tries to show that when you like if you took a bunch of cylinders made out of cardboard, kind of like toilet paper, the, the core of the toilet paper rolls and you put them all together and squished them, they would turn out to be hexagons. Uh, the bee's skill in solving problems, as you can tell, does not end here. Uh, you're gonna hear about the steep angle. See, when one of those cells gets, you know, when you look inside one of those cells, they go deep they go down deep, and there, in there, there's a 3D joint made on the bottom. And McLaurin found out that that too gives a max, uh, you know, get surface area a, a, a minimum and volume a maximum uh, discovered by him. Okay, so now let's take a look at this video. Again, keep me posted. some things about the honeybee. Her industrious buzzing from flower to flower seeking nectar, the delicious product she makes from that nectar, and the potency of her last resort defense. Such things as are commonly known about the bee do not suggest a beehive as a good place for a lesson in mathematics. But here, as in all of nature, Understanding what is happening involves mathematics, for mathematics is the language of science. This piece of honeycomb, a little over an ounce, represents over 20,000 bee miles for a collection of nectar, the raw material, plus over 110,000 bee hours spent transforming the nectar into wax to which must be added more than 18,000 bee hours 
for fashioning the wax into comb, according to a precise pattern. Since honeycomb is so expensive to construct, it's obvious that economy in the use of wax is very important to the welfare of the hive. Is there a geometric shape which is more economical to build than any other? We have made models in which each has the same volume and the same height. Which of these requires the least amount of material to build? That is, which has the smallest lateral surface area. Since the height is the same, the one with the shortest perimeter is the best. More sides mean less perimeter. Thinking of the cylinder as having an infinite number of sides shows that it uses the least material. But cylinders are only economical if they stand alone. Placed together, they leave large gaps between them. Since no walls can be shared, they are wasteful of both space and material. Wherever walls lie side by side, they can be shared by two cells. That is, one wall can do the work of two. Thus, octagons, in which four of eight sides can be shared, save 25% on material. Triangles, by sharing all their sides, and squares, save 50% on material. Therefore, when we consider the savings possible through the sharing of sides, the material needed to construct cylinders does not change. But the other figures require less material, for they share sides. Of all the figures, the hexagon uses the least material. This is the shape the bees use. This discovery of the economy of honeycomb was made over 16 centuries ago by an Alexandrian geometer, Tapas. What he and others have learned about honeycomb has been applied to build the largest grain elevator in the world. The hexagon provided the most economical, the strongest design. Such study of living things is today called bionics. Much effort is being expended to learn from a wide variety of creatures, and results are coming in. The study of the eye of a beetle has resulted in a device installed on planes which measures their ground speed more accurately than had been possible before. Study of the common housefly has given us a new, extremely rugged gyroscope. Indeed, there seems to be no area in which men cannot learn from the abilities and organs which God has given to his creatures. And in practically every instance, mathematical calculations are involved in understanding the animals and in applying what we learn. There is much more we can learn from honeycomb. A structural engineer can show us other advantages of the hexagon among all the patterns the bees might have used. When certain transparent plastics are placed in a polariscope and a stress applied, colored patterns appear. The series of rainbow changes are most numerous where the stress is most concentrated as at the corner of the notch, the weakest point on the bar. The stress patterns from various geometric shapes are most revealing. What if bees had built square cells? One of the drawbacks of square cells is that a load along a partition is not readily transferred to adjacent partitions. In triangular cells, a load at any point is distributed to several members. However, there is a major drawback. The horizontal members are loaded in compression. This is the wrong way to load a thin plate, which readily buckles. In hexagonal cells, however, the load is distributed as a tension. This makes maximum use of the strength of the thin wax walls. The pattern is so strong that less material is needed in the walls to support the load.
Bees take advantage of this and make the walls of the cells less than three thousandths of an inch thick, thinner than a sheet of paper. It's amazing, isn't it? Bees build honeycomb just as if they were graduates from the best schools of engineering, using the shape which is not only the most economical, but also the strongest. The understanding of the polariscope pattern by an engineer requires a great deal of mathematics. In fact, to go into a thorough study of the structure of honeycomb involves mathematics so complex as to require a computer. Part two. This is not part two. Hang on. Industrious buzzing from flower to flower seeking nectar. The delicious product she makes from that nectar. And okay, we got to go to part two. Here we go. Let's look further at the way in which mathematics, some of it quite advanced, has enabled the scientists to understand the structure of the honeycomb. Some two and a half centuries ago, a French astronomer, Miraldi, became fascinated with bees. One thing he noted about the double rank of cells in honeycomb is that their bottoms are not flat, but convex, formed of three rhombi. Obviously, the obtuse angles where bottom meets wall make it easier for the bees to construct the cells and to keep them clean. But Moraldi noted that there was a remarkable constancy to the angles of the rhombi. They measured about 70 degrees. He suggested that the bees had used this angle for the sake of simplicity. For if the acute angles of the rhombi are 70 degrees, 32 minutes, the angles of the side trapezoids are identical. Rayamur, a noted French scientist, suspected that there was a further reason for the special shape. He wrote to a number of mathematicians asking what angle would give the most economical trihedral base on a hexagonal prism. Only one, Kiernig, came up with an answer. To get his answer, he first proved that the volume of all hexagonal prisms with trihedral bases is the same, provided that the height H and the side A remain constant. This is easy to see. If a piece is cut off one place and put back on at another, the volume does not change. But as this distance changes, the shape of the prism and the area of its surface change. If this distance is called x, this is the formula for the surface area. It consists of the areas of the six rectangular sides, less the triangular pieces, plus the areas of the three rhombic ends, which can be calculated by means of the Pythagorean theorem. Substituting in this formula, calculating values for x equals zero, x equals one-tenth, and so on, Plotting these values, x equals four tenths, six tenths, and so on. And then connecting these points gives us a graph which shows that the area is at a minimum when x lies between three tenths and four tenths. In other words, the prism with the flat base and the prism with the very pointed base have more surface area and would require more material to build than the intermediate one. Unfortunately, no amount of graphing or even brute force calculation will yield a mathematically precise answer. But there is an elegant shortcut to an exact answer. Some 300 years ago, Newton invented the calculus. About 75 years later, when few men understood the method, 
Koenig manipulated the formula for the area according to the precise rules of the calculus. The mathematician calls it differentiating with respect to x and equating to zero to minimize. This process yields the precise point where the surface is at a minimum. With complete generality, this occurs when x equals a, the length of a side, times the square root of 2 divided by 4. The cell then has the shape that B uses with the angles of the rabbi that Moraldi gave. Someone may wonder whether this is so economical. Isn't it necessary to waste wax to build two pointed ends? Bees have the answer to this. They build the cells so that the bottoms are offset. Each cell fits into the pocket formed by three cells on the opposite side. Modern science, with its high-speed computers and intricate formulas for stress analysis, has not been able to improve on the honeycomb. It has merely confirmed it as the ideal structural shape. But man could not understand the perfection of this pattern which the Creator had given to the honeybee until after he understood the mathematics involved. For as Galileo noted, that vast book which stands forever open before our eyes, I mean the universe, cannot be read until we have learnt the language. It is written in mathematical language, without which it is humanly impossible to comprehend the single word. This insistence on the importance of mathematics made Galileo the father of modern science, for well, this discovery is the very cornerstone of science. Today, continued scientific progress depends on a more thorough, a broader application of mathematical concepts. Thus, we can discover more of the order the Creator has built into the universe. Only thus can we read further in the great book of nature which lies open before us. Okay, so keep going here. Uh, just to show, um, whoops, went a little too far there. Sorry. Uh, there's a lot. There's there's so much more to this, but I got to be careful. I got to keep my eye on the uh, fifty minute limit here, but. Honey bee calculus. There's just unbelievable. Look, just look at the white text on the screen. Uh, honey, when a honey bee comes back to the hive, and he tell he tells the other bees where where the where the good stuff is, and he tells them by he he get, he does a dance to indicate where he's where the good stuff is. Okay, a waggle dance they call it. How much he wet. It, it basically it amounts to polar coordinates. I don't know if you if you remember that from algebra, r comma theta instead of x comma y. So there's that. Um, anyway, if you go to the toward the bottom of the page, how does the honeybee know how far she has gone? The answer is teased out by an elegant series of experiments. She actually integrates the speed of movement of images across her eyes. Uh, just unbelievable. Um, let's just look at uh, the leatherback turtle. Uh, some of the designs for efficiency. Okay, I don't know if you, here's a picture of a leatherback turtle. Do you see how it's kind of divided into what segments? And those segments increase the efficiency, believe it or not, of how the water flows around them. And that's just that's just the way the leatherback turtle is. Check this out. Engineers, you can find this in any engineering book. They know that in order to get the best flow of a liquid such as blood, so in other words, in your veins and your arteries, a pipe's cubed radius must equal the sum of the cubed radii of each of its branches. So in other words, 
you find all the little branches that are coming off of it, take all those radii, cube them and add them up. That should be the cubed radius of the original main pipe. And that's exactly the relationship found in all living and fossilized creatures from sponges to humans. So why? Because then you'll get the best flow. So you've got a great pump and your pipes have been designed to get maximum flow. Another interesting little problem here is with red blood cells, they have this unique shape. They're like, um, you know, especially look at, the, look at the one down in the bottom right there. See how it's kind of caved in? It's like a disc, but it's caved in in the middle. They call that a biconcave shape because it's concave on the top and concave on the bottom. Right above the, the uh, illustration, you'll see the biconcave shape naturally forms for this area area to volume ratio because it requires the least energy so again minimum built in designed by the creator uh, of course gravity i wanted to talk a little bit about the parabola though we know it's the shape that results from gravity we of course why do we use it for satellite dishes why do we use the same parabola for that? Because that is the perfect shape for focusing all the reflected parallel light rays to the focus where, you know, you can put the receptor. Bottom left, we got a picture there of different uh, shaped nose cones on aircraft. You see that way, uh, and 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 the perfect. The percent of flat surface drag. So you notice way up on the top left, bl a blunt, flat object, of course, that has the most drag. Not great. You come down, and they've got a cone. It's kind of blunted. That's better. In the middle, you see, even better, a cone with a more pointed shape. A hemisphere is better. And the best, <coughs> excuse me, the best, the parabola. And so when you look at an aircraft, next time you look at a passenger airplane or whatever, look at just look at the front end of the plane. It's parabolic in shape, the same shape that God made gravity, as you can see in the picture on the right. Um, this is a Nautilus shell. And I don't know how many of you know this, but that is a special spiral called the logarithmic spiral. Euler, Euler knew, well, knew a lot about this, and he proposed that that might be a good shape for train tracks. And in fact, if you look at the picture at the bottom left, the, the, the drawing at the bottom left, they found that this is the ideal, what? The outer shape of that shell is the ideal shape for exit ramps on highways. Um, of course, the sphere is what? Maximum volume for minimum surface area. It's the best. And, of course, we live on one of those. Um, we, when we were first conceived, we too were spheres. Water naturally forms that way. Here, as you see, picture of dew on grass. Um, we know that there's a special thing going on when two bubbles meet together. And um, we, we've found ways, how can that, how can that, well, that, there's always a minimum involved. Water always seems to want to get to the smallest surface area it can. Minimize surface area. Here we go with calculus again. Okay, how about this? Slime mold topology. A slime mold? You've got to be kidding me. It's a simple, really simple organism. Well, so here's, here's how the experiment works. Initially, you, you make this little maze, okay? And we put some plasmodium, forms, on, forms a net covering the entire maze. A few hours after, 
you put the uh, slime mold out, notice that the path has reduced to a smaller length. And in eight hours, they've got it down to the minimal path through the maze. So even slime mold can figure out the minimum path. And uh, it, yeah, it's, per, it's just pretty amazing. Um, okay, when it comes to knots, that which may seem like a silly concept to you, but really DNA, which is pictured at the top right, is a knot. And um, that can be maximized too. It says at the bottom, obviously not from me, but from the scientists, evolution has already built these solutions into molecules. Uh, let's put it let's let's put it differently. God's creation has already built these solutions into molecules. Uh, liquid logic. So. Solving problems with liquids basically involves calculus because what happens when you make a surface that has different heights and put water on it, immediately the water knows to go to the, the, the least resistance path every time. And you know it always flows downhill because of gravity. And so it instantly solves problems that involve elevation. Plant formations. You can see here in this article, it points out, by the way, there, that's another whole topic that's in my divine design uh, overall presentation. Uh, not presentation, but when you go to the divinemath.com, you'll see. Anyway, this is, this is a sunflower. And you can see there are spiral patterns to how the plant grows, okay? What this points out is this spiraling is a result of the system keeping the energy required for growth to a minimum. So again, nature knows to do the most efficient thing. Optimal design in human hearing. Uh, they've found that the way the ear is constructed, the way it's built is... Our ears use the most efficient way to process sounds we hear, from babbling brooks to wailing babies. You want a better network? And everybody always wants better networks with quicker communications. Would you believe you can take a look at ants? Because if you put a swarm of ants down and some food source, they immediately find the minimum path and the quickest ways to get there. You take a look at coastlines, you wouldn't think there's any mathematics there. I don't know if you've ever heard of fractals, but uh, a coastline just means this. When you look at the coastline and where the water meets the, the land, that's forever changing, of course, but it's rugged. It's, and as you look at smaller and smaller pieces, you still see more and more division. Well, fractal coastlines are the best at damping waves, as you can see here in the white text. That means the way God has made things with these fractal co coastlines, it does the best job of handling waves that are coming in and thereby, thereby minimizing uh, erosion. You can see here, study um, the wing beat of various insects. Now let's just read this. We've described the geometry of the wing beat, says Graham Taylor of the University of Oxford, uh, United Kingdom. Swimmers and flyers from insects to whales all cruise at the speed that lets them slip along most easily. They have evidence to show that. Here we see nature's design turned into a breakthrough in making a better fan and you can see at the bottom right uh, another view of this is the uh, helicopter seed and you have uh, you've probably all experienced dropping those efficiency and nature definitely has it here you see something called phototropism where plants automatically what lean toward 
the light source. They grow and bend in the direction of light to achieve maximum efficiency. So, just a touch. There is so much more to this. I just wanted to give you a, a feel. This is why I really like studying calculus, because it points out with a huge exclamation point that what God has made is truly what? Very good. It is truly optimal. Okay, thanks. There is another version of this. Uh, I'll, I'll have two of them up on the website. Did anybody have any questions? I don't really like talking the whole time, but kind of thing you have to do to make to, to at least attempt to get enough information out for you guys to uh, have a chance to take it in and evaluate it. Thank you very much for your participation. Have a good one. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll start uh, course review.